Again, we are live with class. Night visiting, aka that's... first episode that's passable. I'm actually surprised that you found one that you like, Nicholas. I remember the first time I saw this episode liking the concept and thinking the execution was really lackluster, but I don't know what changed in the ensuing months, but watching it a second time, I'm like, oh, there's actually a lot of good here, and the negatives are far outweighed by the positives for once. Uh, I guess we can start with the creature. The Lankin, yeah. Where I'm sort of torn, because I like the idea of the Lankin itself, but I also more like the idea of what it was pretending to be. I sort of have to struggle because, like, yeah, we need a villain, and that makes it more overtly the villain, but it also feels kind of cop out e because it would have been really fascinating to do, like, an episode or even a two-parter where... It really does have the souls of your loved ones, and it really is a genuine choice, and you're not just being duped, like, for the sake of ending with any kind of finality. We can't exactly do that, so it just has to be a con. And the con is still interesting. It's still a cool idea to, like, use dead loved ones to lure people, but it feels a bit more generic than just actually being those dead loved ones. What what have the last two episodes of this show been? We've got, like... Generic alien invasion and a giant dragon mates with hey, another dragon. Hey, the dragon tattoo was cool. I'm, I'm just saying, the show hasn't been hard sci-fi or anything. Doctor Who, especially in Moffat's era, has skewed more towards science fantasy. I think, like, if you were to rank all the stuff in the Doctor Who universe and levels of, like, sci-fi hardness, like, how much are we paying attention to the science? Like, which part of this is... How much is this era sci-fi? Which part of this era is fantasy? Yada, yada, yada. I would say that, like, the audio stories are probably the most sci-fi, and yet also the most fantastical. Like, it varies yes. from story to story. Plus, the audios are the only ones to bother doing anything interesting with the Cybermen. <laughs> and then the classic series would be a little bit more science fiction than I think the modern series tends to get. Torchwood may be a little bit more science than fantasy. There but was an episode is really just like death is the villain in Torchwood, so it goes back and forth. Yeah, but class so far consistently seems to be, we're science fiction in name only. This could pretty much be like a fantasy series. It could be supernatural, but the excuse is just different. Say that that's a legit disappointment just because the show labels itself a sci-fi show over anything else. But I don't know, it makes the Doctor Who universe feel a bit more varied when, like, the reasons for things can vary in terms of this is science. This is also science, but it feels a bit more like fantasy, and they can all exist in one giant conglomerate universe. For all we know, Buffy the Vampire Slayer happens in the Doctor Who universe. As much as I would like Case, Buffy is a TV show in class, so maybe not so much. Class ruined it. Then again, there's nothing to actually confirm that. They don't say Buffy, they just say Hellmouth. Maybe Buffy does exist in the Doctor Who universe. Just happen to know someone from Sunnydale who's like, Hey, have you heard about this thing called the Hellmouth? Yeah! This is the geekiest thing we've done on one of these, and that's saying a lot. Yes, it is. What's wrong with that? It's our target audience. Nothing wrong with that at all. The intro, and how I really like the intro, and I should mention that. I don't like the intro. I liked it. Because I will yeah. be the defender of class in this trio. I mean, not for this episode. I actually quite like this episode, so I think it's going to be like the two of us versus Lucy, maybe. I don't know. Just like how I will defend Torchwood to my grave when we get to it. Oh, yeah. You, you might have to do that. I don't know how much positive I'm going to have to say about Torchwood. But focusing on this episode... Because I took notes sort of in the order that things happened in the episode, and I'm wondering if I should just go from starting with the negatives and then getting to positives later. Ugh, let's take it from the top. Taking it from the top, like, my first big problem with the episode, and it's not really a big problem, but it's like, I'm not really sure what we're trying to do with Tanya's character, because her reaction to her dad suddenly appearing in her room, like, she sees him, doesn't say anything. We cut to the intro, we cut back, and she's like, 
really chill about it until she leaves the room. Like, her dad's like, I, I came back to see you. And she's like, yeah, because dead people are doing that all the time. That really bugged <laughs> me how her reaction was. Maybe she regularly gets visited from the first evil from Buffy. Clearly that's her deflecting and, like, bottling her emotions because she does have a genuine feeling reaction as soon as she leaves the room. I don't buy that she would, like, deflect that quickly, bury her feelings under snark that fast. Like, her immediate reaction should be, oh god, my dad is in my room, what's happening, am I going insane? Instead, like, she saves that reaction until she's not in front of him anymore, and I'm like, if that's just the thing that this character does, is that they, like, hide their emotions until they're in private, then okay, but I don't buy that that's what they do right here. If you saw somebody that died, okay, a family member, and you're by yourself with them, your reactions wouldn't be like, you're not my dad, whatever. I mean, just like, what? Jock would, like, override any, like, defense mechanisms that you'd have. Well, it made Jack wonder what happens when you attach someone's head during Miracle Day seem perfectly reasonable. Yes. Okay. I guess. <laughs> But yeah, it's like, I feel like Patrick Ness has a take on this character that I just am not grasping fully yet. She acts more alien than the alien. I mean, maybe I'm just missing something, and like, the more I watch of this show, the more it'll come to light that, oh no, this is just, this isn't like her being written weird, this is just who she is. But until, like, we get more solid evidence of that, it just feels like this character is being written strange for the sake of convenience. Yes, it is. It might get better as it goes, but even if it does, her character, that's just the way she is. I do not believe a person would act that way. It felt very awkward. Yeah, I guess the most simplistic way to phrase it is that I can't tell if this is a take or if Patrick Ness just isn't writing well. Probably both. <laughs> Moving on, another thing thing that is in the same scene sort of tying into the same problem that i had with last week's episode maybe i'm just used to it it's less of a problem here than it was there but the constant cutting between conversations i don't understand why we're doing that like um uh, the big one for me the first time it happens is when um, mateus comes to charlie and quill's house and he comes to talk about stuff and the conversation doesn't even really start he like just says a sentence to charlie like i've got something that i want to talk to you about and then before the conversation starts we cut away to april skyping ram and they talk for a little bit about nothing that's really consequential and we cut back and charlie and mateus are in the middle of this conversation about their parents and like their relationship why can't this show ever just have two characters enter a scene, start a conversation, finish the conversation, and then let the scene end. Why can't- Ask Patrick Ness who directed the episode and who edited the episode. Ask those three people. It's just, sometimes it works though. Like when, um, when Tanya's talking to her dad and Quill is talking to her sister, it makes perfect sense that you'd do that cut between those two conversations because they're both getting the same information. You wouldn't want to repeat that, but you also wouldn't want to skip over either of their reactions. So you intercut those two conversations and there it makes sense. But other times it's not serving any purpose. It's just like Patrick Ness or whoever did the editing has ADD and they can't just let a conversation be a whole scene? Yes. I mean, like you said, sometimes it does work, like in the scenes that you were talking about, but he does it. It seems to be like a cliche with him. Sometimes it's, it does that weird thing that other shows do. April tells Ram about like how she's nice all the time because she's constantly at war. Then we cut away and by the time we cut back, they're running in, like, a different location. Like, they've been presumably running in silence for a while before he's like, well, what do you mean? And then they finish that conversation. It's a little awkward when they do that. It's like, so did they ask a question and then they just run across the street and then finish the conversation? Since we're talking about April, does anyone find it real forced whenever, like, any time that April mentions being nice yeah. or people talk about how nice she is? Yes, it felt very forced. It's more of that, okay, we don't know how to make the character traits appear on screen, so we're just going to say them. She's not a not nice person, <laughs> but like, what has she done in any of these three episodes that makes her more nice than, say, Tanya or Charlie? Like I said, she's not not nice. 
she's just not exceptionally nice and everyone is acting like she is and it's weird and it's weird especially that she acts like she is like no one accuses her of being overly nice that often but she'll act like it's something that people make a big deal out of yeah it's like okay i'm so nice everybody mean to me for being nice it kind of reminds me of talking to his boyfriend and saying like stuff about humor is going to be missed on me because i'm an alien you don't come off like an alien dude but i guess to like tangent onto a positive like that same speech where she's talking about like niceness <sighs> and and sensibility she's like why i'm so nice and sensible she actually has a pretty good like speech about like her dad and how her dad like injured her mom and how she has the same like musical taste as her dad but if she were to give that up just for the sake of like distancing herself from him that's just letting him have more control over her that's that's a really good speech but by the end of it i'm like she's like that's why i'm so sensible what did any of what you just said have to do with being sensible it didn't. But I, it's a nice character moment. I just, word choices. I also, to just to keep on things that I like, um, I like the conversation between um, Mateus and Charlie about, like, love and how it's different for Charlie's species than it is for humans. That's, like, a thing that I think we should do more often whenever we have aliens. They have roughly equivalent concepts for things that are super integral to what we consider the human experience. But, like, the definition is different to the point where it's like, oh, oh, okay, how does that society work? They have the concept of love, but they define it as combining for, like, mutual benefit. And that's sort of what the Lankin is doing. And the Lankin is, like, appealing to a human sense of, like, love and loss in order to do that. So how different are the two concepts really? Like, how much of human love is just, you have something I want, I have something you want, let's full benefit. And then, like, the fact that the two of them have each other, and they are in love, and so they're the only ones who don't actually, like, have to deal with seeing people from the tentacles. Everyone else doesn't have someone the way that they have each other, and so they need that love in the way that the two of them don't. Uh, speaking of love, do we buy that Ram and the nice girl got together already? Oh, no, 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 I <laughs> forgot to... Like, surrounding this really good character moment that is, like, her talking about her dad with stuff that doesn't make any sense, she just kisses him. Like, no build-up, no, no, like, him relating to her. Like, if she'd had that speech and maybe he'd said something or conveyed something to, like, oh, I can relate to you, I empathize with what you just said, and, like, prompted her to, like, oh, I can connect to this person. Again, combining, and then they kiss. But no, like, she just sort of kisses him without, like, him doing anything to, like, warrant it? Like, what happened? <laughs> what changed between the two of you? Also a bit awkward since or they're on the Skype call. He's being a real dick to her. <laughs> he does have the line where he's like, I'm more of Tanya's friend than you are. And she's like, it's not a competition. Why was that even in there? So well, I mean, he's not wrong. Really it douchey thing to say for no reason. I mean, I understand. Like, you know, you have some people that you're friends with more than others. You were worried about her safety or something. You worry about her not answering your <laughs> phone call. And then he's like, well, like, oh, well, why are you even worried about her? I'm more of her friend than you. It's like, yeah. <laughs> Edward, thoughts on Ram being a dick and also kissing? None. None at all. <laughs> okay. I guess the only big thing left to talk about is, like, everything involving the Lankin itself. Which is, like, I like the visual of, like, giant creepy tentacles all around town. And, like, connecting through houses and stuff. Well, I guess they use the ghosts, or whatever you want to call it, the dead loved ones, to manipulate them. But do you think more people would be, like, unaware of this? Because at the end, they say everyone forgot about it. Weird. What made them forget? There had to be it's, some people that saw it and didn't, you know, get ghosts or anything. It's Doctor Who. If the human race can forget Daleks shooting at each other in London in the 80s, they'll probably forget this. Yeah, but over time, not immediately after the thing goes back into the portal, they lampshade it like, oh, that's very convenient that everyone just forgot. Just because you lampshade it doesn't mean you can't explain how they all forgot. Yes. 
I hate that when they do that. Unless we're just supposed to infer that being trapped by the Lankin will erode your memories or whatever. So that the only reason the main characters remember is that they never actually got trapped. But then, like Lucy said, there has to have been some other people throughout this town who didn't, like, fall for it or didn't have someone, like, presented for them and saw all of these weird tentacles. The Seventh Doctor has a line for this. Human civility to self-deception is only rivaled by its creativity when trying to destroy itself. I guess that's just the thing of this universe, I suppose. I don't know. This is lazy. You have a character point out the convenience of something. That doesn't make it any better. It actually makes it worse. The whole third act, really, or not even the third act, just like the climax has a whole convenience issue. Like, Ram watches one guy grab his mom and get absorbed. And we cut to Tanya and her not dad, and her not dad is like, we just absorbed someone. Ooh, geez, there was a lot of anger there. He doesn't, like, react strongly to it. He just sort of makes note of it. And then go forward to the end of the episode. She's like, I gave you my anger instead of my grief. And that, like, poisons it. That Those two moments seem like they're contradicting each other. And I think it's supposed to be a setup payoff thing. Like they mention, ooh, we just absorbed some anger. She gives it anger later. But the reaction is too different. Like, was the implication of the earlier scene supposed to be that anger is bad for them? Because that's not what's conveyed. No, I didn't notice it until, like, you brought it up again. Like you said, he, when he absorbs anger, he gets a little flustered by it. But I don't think that's enough. So. I didn't even take that as flustered. I took it as, like, indigestion. <laughs> yes. Pretty much. And then, like, um, Quill shows up with a bus and hits the, um, the tentacle that's Tanya's dad. And she hits that tentacle, drags him out of the window. And that makes, like, the whole network of tentacles decide to retreat because one of them got hit with the bus. That feels real easy. Yes. Also, I hate that both the nice girl and Ram step in front of the creature to get kidnapped. I don't think that thing can go very fast or, like, because Tanya... It left her left the room, so why didn't they just all walk out the room? Hmm. Yeah, wait a minute, why not? That's weird. Maybe you could argue it could follow them and it just let her leave the first time because it knew she needed to process and that she'd come back in. But they never try it again. That's the problem. <laughs> and it makes yeah, worse that's... because both of them take steps forward towards it to let them get captured. I'm just indifferent. <laughs> Eh, fair enough. I did not think I would see the day where I would have the most positive reaction to an episode of this show out of the three of us. We're only on episode three. I hope that this trend of me, like, liking episodes better than I did the first time continues. I considered this one of the highlights of the series the first time I watched it, and granted it still has big problems that I just went over, but I mean, I think we're gonna get episodes at least this good once or twice more after this, so that's something to look forward to. Before we go on, I wanted to ask about what's the deal with the sister taking a human Form. Why isn't she in makeup? Budget I'm cuts. I'm yep. I'm convinced that's all it is. They didn't want to spend money on giving her an elaborate makeup costume just for the few scenes that she's in. Everyone knows the big money goes into the finale. Which I mean, to be fair, I don't know how much money the Lincoln costs. Like, at least some of those giant long tentacles are practical, and they're all over the city. Maybe that was, like, their practical effects budget for the episode? Here's my problem, okay, with it. If you can spend the money on and the time to make them up for that joke, that very <laughs> awkward, funny joke, okay, they could have took the money and time they spent on a joke that didn't work and just came across as awkward and used it towards this, and it would work much better. The only excuse you'd have is if the one-off joke wasn't actually makeup, and it was just a digital effect, but that seems unlikely. Yeah, it looked like makeup. Plus, logistically, it doesn't make any sense that the Lankin would present her with her sister looking different than she remembers her. Clearly, they'd want to capitalize on, like, her memories of her and whatever emotions the visual of her appearance would bring out. Yeah. But money, I guess. I don't know. It just seems like a very mishandling of money there. Maybe it just shows that my standards for this show are, like, through the floor because 
I think by this show's standards, this is a pretty, really good episode, but it has a lot of problems. Like, enough problems that would probably break an episode if I went in with higher expectations. But, I don't know, enough of it works. Like, thematically, I guess. The the big thing that keeps it from falling apart is that I really do like what we do with the whole love and combining and what that means theme. And it's it feels like for the first time we actually have an idea that the sci-fi stuff is just in service of an idea. What was the deal with the... I mean, I get that it's trying to lure people to uh, touch it, but it's using, uh, I'm talking about the sister. She has the gun. It's like, you're already dead. Why would this affect her? She's going to try to kill a dead person over again? She tries to goad her into having a fight. And like, yeah, that's how you would appeal to Quill. But at the same time, like, I don't know, why can't they just touch that? I I don't know. I mean, they say it has to be voluntary, so I'm assuming that's just like a rule. They need voluntary people before they can do anything. Not allowed to touch them at all? Can, like, the sister not, like, punch Quill in the face first, and then Quill will absolutely punch her back, and then that's voluntary touching. Yeah. Well, apparently they can't touch because, you know, they captured the Graham and the nice girl. Remember, it grabbed them and wrapped around them. You can't suck them up, though, like, yeah, until they have, like, grief. But if it's goading her up and goading her on for a fight, that's not going to get grief. It's going to get anger, isn't it? Yeah. But, so, see, this is why I'm confused. Like, is it just grief that they take, or is grief one of many emotions that they can take, and it just happens to be their favorite? No, because it says that anger poisons them. Uh, I don't know, man. It's just real weird. <laughs> But yeah, I guess the only other thing I have to talk about, like, character or story point-wise at all is, like, Quill. I think it's sort of interesting because she comes in, everyone's all together. Tanya's like, see, this is what happens when they work as a team. And it's, like, their first real moment. Like, in three episodes, this is the first real moment of them, like, commiserating over victory as, like, a group. And Quill is just like, I'm gonna barf. But it looks kind of like she wants to be included, and then she leaves. And the exact moment she leaves is when April asks, where did you guys get the bus from? And she's the one who brought the bus, so... If she just stayed for like a minute longer, they'd actually have something to talk with her about. I think there are a couple of ways you could take that. Like, does she want to be part of the group, but is putting on a show? Or does she really just not know how to relate to these people? Or what's going on? It's very hard. Like you said, it's, it can be interpreted either way. I think they're trying, I guess, to make it like she kind of wants to be part of the gang, but still trying. Like she's trying to convince that she doesn't? Yeah. What was the deal with her in the gun part at the very end? I don't know. I'm not entirely sure how to take that. Is that just a normal handgun? And if so, where'd she get it? Whatever, I guess. It felt like we need to end it on something, and then we have nothing. So we're just gonna have the scene with her and the gun. That's about it. I mean, if nothing else, this episode managed to give me some things to talk about without getting angry for once. (laughs) Your expectations are getting too low, Nicholas. Let's just hope that that trend continues. I don't know, man. (laughs) I struggle to call it a good episode of TV, but there's enough good in it that it's not a bad episode, you know. Mm. I'm not indifferent towards it. The stuff that I like, I really like, but I don't know. It's got massive issues. Well, I guess final thoughts, or... Those are my thoughts. Okay. Edward's fun card. He has nothing to say, I guess. Edward, are you still with us? Yes. Are you still alive? Robert, go watch Spearhead in Space. Yeah, you don't have to watch class next week. We're talking about Outbreak. Yes, we're talking about this thing. Yeah. That will be the first Torchwood audio I've listened to, so that should be interesting. Hopefully we will have more positive things to say next week. Just remember, under the skin. Gary. See ya.